video from quite a long time ago now. Um, and uh, that choppiness is part of the quality of what it is. And here it is. I love the beginning part. Entrepreneurs brought to you by Merrill Lynch. Wherever there are investment opportunities, Merrill Lynch is there, serving individuals, institutions, corporations, and governments with a wide range of financial and investment services. Merrill Lynch. Stephen Jobs figures heroically in the history of American entrepreneurship. At the age of 22, he founded a company called Apple Computer and proceeded to grow it into a $2 billion business. In the spring of 1985, he lost a power struggle inside Apple and left the company he had created. He spent the summer considering his next move and resolved to begin again. In September, he started a new computer company with his own money. With characteristic flair, he called it Next Incorporated. This morning, at its offices in Silicon Valley, California, the company is about to get a first look at its new trademark, the signature it hopes to make familiar around the world. The designer, Paul Rand, created the logos for IBM, Westinghouse, UPS, and many others. Rand doesn't normally work for infant companies, even if they could afford him, but Next isn't an ordinary startup. The idea is to please don't open, don't look at the back first. This is the front. And don't get scared. This is not the design. <laughs> 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 I did this with a sort of floor of Steve when he saw it, you know, and figured, Jesus, a hundred thousand bucks down the drain. <laughs> I'm sure that's what he thought. <laughs> Jobs has had a sneak preview of the logo and loves it. As he waits for a verdict from his staff, he can hardly contain his excitement. Assertive as he is, he values consensus. Most of these young computer and software designers were on the team that developed the Macintosh. Mm -hmm. They left secure jobs at Apple to follow their boss in pursuit of his new vision. <laughs> Steve's goal is to transform the learning process at the college and graduate school level with a powerful computer and a new kind of software. And we decided we wanted to start a company that had a lot to do with education, and in particular, higher education, colleges and universities. So what our vision is, is that there's a revolution in software going on now on college and university campuses. And it has to do with providing uh, two types of breakthrough software. One is called simulated learning environments. It's where you can't give a student in physics a linear accelerator. You can't give a student in biology a $5 million recombinant DNA laboratory, but you can simulate those things. You can simulate them on a very powerful computer. And it is, it is not possible for students to afford these things. It is not possible for most faculty members to afford these things. So if we can take what we do best, which is to find really great technology and pull it down to a price point that's affordable to people, if we can do the same thing for this type of computer, which is maybe ten times as powerful as a personal computer, that we did for personal computers, then I think we can make a real difference in the way the learning experience happens in the next five years. And that's what we're trying to do. Companies come and go at the crest of the wave. I mean, you know, IBM had their day way back when, when they, you know, they were at the crest. In December 1985, in business for just 90 days, Jobs and his 11 employees hold their first retreat. Company retreats like this are the continuation of a tradition Steve established at Apple early on. Watching him in action at these brainstorming sessions is an opportunity to observe him at his lucid best as a company builder and motivator. Slicing into the future. His opening remarks reveal his faith in high technology and his idealism, an unusual combination that is part of his uniqueness. In effect, he is planting the seeds of a new corporate culture. More important than building a product, we are in the process of architecting a company. 
that will hopefully be much, much more incredible. The total will be much more incredible than the sum of its parts. Okay. Uh, we're going to stop it there. Uh, so Steve Jobs, at the end, he invokes the kind of rhetoric of Gestalt, which is, is if you had been enrolled in the class or seen the set of lectures, um, we talk about the whole is not greater than the sum of the parts. The whole is something different than the sum of the parts. Anyway, uh, we're not going to let Steve Jobs have the last word. Um, this is an image of Paul Rand about around, you know, not very long after that time in an advertisement from, from Apple. And of course, we are very familiar with Paul Rand's work. Um, it's uh, Travel Down. We're less familiar with George Corrin's work. I'm going to add a postscript. Uh, George Corrin Jr. graduated top of his class at Carnegie Mellon in 1948. And the dean who initially rejected him, uh, Harry Botcher, um, presented, uh, delivered an award, the April, Apple uh, Memorial Award to uh, George Corrin, who's there on the left. Uh, we see him graduating from Carnegie Mellon. Now, um, I, I knew George. I was a friend of George, George's. I met him when around 2001. He was in his early 80s. And we were introduced by a mutual friend. Uh, she was in theater and she knew that I had just graduated from Yale and that George went to Yale studying drama. Um, and he always was interested to meet other working designers. Turns out he had a studio um, right around the corner from where mine was. Mine was on 39th Street. He had, had a studio on 42nd Street. Marvelous old place, great place. Uh, and so we used to go for occasional um, martinis. That's kind of what was on order uh, at the end of the day. And he also would, would uh, regularly show me various bits of design work that he had done or that he liked in his, in his studio. And in fact, I'm pretty sure it is, I'm not, I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure it's George who introduced me really to the work of Bruno Minari. I can remember him showing me um, Nella Nebbia di, di Milano, um, a children's book that Minari made with um, vellum sheets. He, George is really impressed by that. Um, anyway, I once had him, he came, I was able to, he, he came to my class when I first started teaching at NYU, it was about 2001 and showed a bunch of work. But even though we had our, you know, our conversations were really pretty much always about design, I never knew any part of his story or his background, really. Um, I knew where he had worked. I knew he worked on the sets for Sesame Street, for example. Um, and I knew he'd mostly worked in theater, but I didn't know anything about how he studied and where he worked. Um, he never let on about it. I surely should have asked, I was curious. But I, but I didn't. Um, about, well, five years ago, 2015 spring, uh, George passed away at age 93. Um, yeah, and I think this image, which is, I went back at the time and I've gone back looking for, for pictures and it was pre-iPhone and I gave away all my slides. I used to have a bunch of other things. I didn't really find anything. And this is a, an image of George, though, which I think captures the person who I knew in which, um, uh, yeah, kind of seriously, but smilingly uh, staring at the frame. Okay, uh, well, that is, that is it. And so I should stop sharing my screen at this point. One second. Wonderful. Thank you, David, so much. Um, I love that story of the sort of sonography that George Corrin was so um, sort of masterful um, and controlling, and particularly in that you know three thousand mile distance, which we're kind of doing a similar distance um, type of exchange right now, and. Um, yeah, thanks so much for sharing that because I think I do think it's 
I'll sort of close the loop on all of the various topics that um, you covered in the lecture series quite nicely. Um, I did want to, so I have a question. I don't know if anyone else has any questions. And if you do, please feel free to drop a note in the chat. But I was just thinking about sonography. I'm looking at the image behind you. And, you know, we had sort of together imagined this space where something would happen. And there's a, you know, kind of poster um, wall mural. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Traveling through time and space. It's terrifying. Um, <laughs> but yeah, exactly. So there's yeah, this physical kind of distance that had to be mediated. We knew it was going to be filmed, so we wanted you know, the setup to be right. But there's this whole part that we're not seeing in the frame also, which is that you um, had kindly provided a whole series of PDFs that we printed and produced into a kind of library environment where students could sit and actually read something when they were tired of hearing your getting raspy voice so they could kind of take a break and come back and re-engage. And then you'd also um, done an installation of your students' work. And that was also incredible because it was multiple projections and it was sort of in front of you. If you're sitting in the room right now, it's kind of in front of you. So it was the backdrop for when you were presenting and there was this kind of exchange between what you were showing on screen and then you could also see um, in the background what the students had done as a result of what you had shown on screen and these whole feedback loops and I just think that you have an interesting approach um, in how you share resources and you've maintained online you know incredible um, libraries of relevant graphic design content that I know for us has been a resource for a long time and I know for many educators actually they've turned to typography.org and um, gestalt.org and all of these places. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about yeah these kind of feedback loops and how you share information with classes and teaching today. Yeah uh, well let's see there are a few things. First of all the um, the scenography, like the setup in Los Angeles was so much a part of, um, of, of what made that event um, particular. And, uh, and without any idea of really capturing that in the book, we didn't have any idea of necessarily capturing that in the book, but that, that lends itself to, it, that sets a different tone in the room. And so mm -hmm. it makes the material different. And it's something about like kind of performing, performing the material or like, or performing it in public, which I always think is really um, something I like. And it's not to do with just the performance aspect, but it's the like doing it in public. You're not hiding anything and you're doing it knowing that other people are watching in some way. And um, I think like any impulse to share things is more about just making it public it's not that I like want everybody to have these things. I just want it to be visible. And I don't mean just like visible for myself, but it's kind of like working in a, uh, it's just about like kind of staging teaching, you know, like in the, I think the same way with working, like there's some aspect of kind of self-conscious, like how you set up your situation working and what you call yourself and what you do. And I've always been really attuned to all of that. So it's less of a kind of, um, it's less of a generous gesture to like share this with other people and more of a kind of like impulse to raise the stakes on it. Yeah, 